Sorry, America. Uh, today, uh, I want to thank uh, Diana and Don Wagner for inviting me to speak to you in honor of Father's Day on the topic of the founding fathers as fathers. And I, I think it's a wonderful topic. It's very well chosen. And it's something that we don't often think about. You know, we think about Washington, Madison, Adams, Jefferson as as political leaders, uh, as fathers of the country, uh, founding fathers, but we tend to overlook the fact that before they were that, they were fathers of families. And so I think it's a wonderful topic. It's something I'm very interested in, and I wanted to present to you today uh, some of what I've learned about a particular founding father, the founding father of all founding fathers, <laughs> the father of his country, <laughs> Uh, George Washington. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit about his relationship with his stepson, John Custis, who uh, was known by the nickname of Jackie. So uh, Jackie Custis and his stepfather, George Washington. Um, and I, I just want to talk a little about their relationship and uh, maybe draw some lessons and maybe you all can help me draw lessons as well for sure. Um, many of you are parents, and uh, many of you are fathers. So jo George Washington and his only son, uh, Jackie Custis, I think the best place to start is with the marriage of George Washington and Martha Custis in 1759. Uh, Martha Custis was a, a very rich Virginia widow at the time that George Washington married her. Uh, he was 26, she was 27. She brought into the marriage two surviving children from her previous marriage. John, nicknamed Jackie, who was only four years old at the time, and Martha, nicknamed Patsy, who was two years old. So Martha Custis married George Washington in 1759. They would have no biological children together. We don't know exactly why not, um, I think we can rule out their w willful choice not to have children. That would be a pretty anachronistic explanation for why they didn't have children of their own. Uh, some have speculated that Washington was infertile, maybe because he contracted smallpox earlier in, the li in life. Uh, some have s speculated that Martha uh, was made infertile somehow by her last pregnancy. Uh, but in any case, they had no biological children together. And so Martha brings in these two children to the marriage. She also brought to the marriage one of the most lucrative estates in all of Virginia. When her husband, her first husband, Daniel Custis, died in 1757, he left behind some 18,000 acres. And these lands were worked by anywhere from 250 to 300 slaves. The slaves, along with personal property of, of Daniel Custis, were valued at the time at 30,000 pounds. Added to that were liquid assets totaling another 10,000 pounds. One thing Daniel Custis did not leave behind, however, was a will. Under English law, that meant, uh, you know, English law applied. And in this case, the law required that one-third of his personal property went to his widow, Martha. She also received one-third of his land and slaves for her use during her lifetime. The daughter, Patsy, received one-third of her father's personal property. But the greatest beneficiary was the heir at law, John Park Custis, Jackie Custis. He received not only a third of his father's personal property and uh, two-thirds of his father's land and slaves, but also the remaining third of those land and, lands and slaves, which were for his mother's use while she lived, would pass to Jackie once she died. So young Jackie Custis, or Master Custis, was one of the wealthiest four-year-olds in all of Virginia <laughs> when his mother married uh, George Washington. And George Washington became a minister of all three pieces of Daniel Custis's estate, the piece that was for Martha, the piece that was for Patsy, and the piece that was for Jackie. And by all appearances, Washington administered it well. 
With regard to Jackie, and this is the relationship I'll be focusing on today, uh, Washington kept the boys' lands in reasonable productivity, often lending out at interest the income generated from those lands. Every two years, Washington was required to give an accounting of the estate to a Virginia court. So all of his financial administration of, of Jackie's property was subject to oversight by the government. But Washington never adopted the two Custis children. All three Custises, the two children and Martha, of course, came to live at Mount Vernon in 1759, but only Martha became a Washington. Jackie and Patsy remained Custises. They retained the Custis inheritance, the Custis name, even the Custis coat of arms. And their family and friends remained Custis family and friends. So there was kind of an ongoing uh, understanding of separation uh, between George Washington on the one hand and the Custis children. Uh, they were, in a sense, uh, uh, part of another family growing up under his roof and under his care. George's relationship with Jackie never quite matured. We don't know how well stepfather and stepson got along in the early years. It is generally believed that Martha indulged her son and that George was very conscious of his status as, as simply a guardian and that he deferred to Martha in ways that he would not have had Jackie been his biological son. It's hard to test that theory because George never had a biological son. But that is the theory. Um, we know very little about the earliest years of his fathering of Jas Jackie Custis, but George certainly had ample time to bond with Jackie and be a true father to him. Each of them had a strong emotional interest in making that bond strong. Jackie had no recollection of his biological father, who had died when Jackie was only two. Washington was the only father Jackie would ever know. And Jackie was the only son Washington would ever know as became apparent when years passed without he and Martha conceiving any children. Sorry to be flipping pages on you, but it helps me keep track. Um, yet the relationship seems never to have quite matured into a strong, loving bond between father and son. This is not to say that Washington did not try. He managed Jackie's estate. He provided materially for the boy. He made great efforts to provide Jackie the education that Washington himself lacked. But this effort exposed weaknesses in both father and son. Washington did not know well the world of learning. He had to lean on. He had to trust the judgment of others, their judgment of what books were best, of what educational method was best, of where or from whom an education was best had. Jackie, for his part, emerges in the record as a boy who flatly did not like books. He was amiable, he was sociable, he doesn't appear to have been particularly uh, rebellious, but not academic. Washington's goals for his son were impeded by his own shortcomings as well as Jackie's. All fathers will hear the ring of familiarity here. <laughs> From 1761 to 1768, Jackie was tutored by a man named Walter McGowan, who lived at Mount Vernon for the purpose. When McGowan left for England to be ordained as an Anglican priest, Washington contacted another tutor, Jonathan Boucher. Boucher was also an Anglican priest who conducted a small school for boys in Virginia. Boucher and the Washington household would be linked through Jackie Custis for the next five years. Indeed, the correspondence between George Washington and the tutor, Jonathan Boucher, is the most extensive exchange that survives in all of Washington's papers from the colonial period. The correspondence reveals a father closely involved in his son's education and well-being. Certainly, some of what Washington conveyed, conveyed to Boucher originated with Martha Washington, a mother's concerns you know, expressed through the pen of the father. But I can't help but be struck by the level of detail to which this future commander of the Continental Army and first president 
mastered concerning the well-being of young Jackie. Washington tracked down books needed for Jackie's schooling, provided for his clothing and other daily needs, inquired as to the boy's health. He did many things connected with Jackie, Jackie's education that today are often done by mothers rather than fathers. Above all, it was Washington who communicated with Jackie's teacher, not Martha. So Jackie would be under the wing of this uh, tutor, Jonathan Boucher, for about four years. These were formative years for Jackie, ages 14 to 18. Washington, in effect, made Boucher a second father to Jackie. Boucher would ultimately claim that he could do more good for Jackie than anyone else. Initially, both Washington and Boucher were very hopeful about Jackie's education. Washington described Jackie as, quote, a boy of good genius, untainted in his morals, and of innocent manners. A child of very large fortune, Jackie would come, Washington said, with his own boy, his own slave, and two horses to convey him to church and other places. Jackie would be absolutely under Boucher's care, this is Washington's language, to manage as you think proper in all respects. Washington, who lamented his own lack of formal education, hoped to make Jackie, as he put it, quote, fit for more useful purposes than a horse racer, etc. You know, there's lots of fears uh, in the Washington household that, that Jackie's going to just become someone who loves horse races. And, you know, guns and horses, you know, there's this guns and horses over and over again. Uh, they, they want him to, to do something higher, to receive a true liberal education, to go to HBU, for example. <laughs> just thought I had to throw that in. Um, Boucher, for his part, was flattered in Washington's interest and keen on taking the boy in. Ever since I have heard of Master Custis, he wrote, I have wished to call him one of my little flock. The business was quickly arranged. Within a month's time, Jackie Custis had moved to Reverend Boucher's residence in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It was Jackie's first real time away from home, and soon Washington, the concerned father, was inquiring, quote, how Jackie is reconciled to an absence from home, unusual to him till now. Boucher reported that Jack was an exceedingly mild and meek boy, but was quickly settling in. For upwards of two years, Jackie continued under Boucher's tutelage. We know little of its progress, and unfortunately, Washington himself probably did not have much idea of what was going on either. But after Boucher proposed that he take Jackie on a European tour, Washington's eyes gradually began to be opened. Boucher believed the trip would uh, stimulate Jackie to study harder. Europe would show Jackie men of letters before, him, before whom he would be embarrassed not to hold his own. Europe would also expose the boy to men of science from whom he might learn things about farming that alone would make the trip worth the expense. He would also escape the provincialism of Virginia. Washington appears to have seriously considered the proposal but he let Boucher know how important the question of expense was, and in doing so, Washington revealed how different his position was from that of a, quote, natural parent. A natural parent, Washington said, could put his finances at risk and be accountable only to his conscience in the case of a misguided expenditure for his child. A guardian such as Washington was, by contrast, must account to the government for his expenditures from his ward's estate. A mistake in finances committed by a guardian, Washington remarked, often incurs the severest censure and sometimes punishment. So this is an interesting, very interesting thing to me. You know, many of the expenses of raising Jackie are paid for by Jackie's own estate. It looks to me like, you know, beyond food and board, uh, Jackie is being raised with funds from his father's estate, not from, with funds from George Washington's possessions or income. Uh, and so that's what Washington is raising here. He's saying, you know, I, I can't pay for an expensive European tour for, for Jackie out of Jackie's estate funds. 
if it looks fishy, I could get in trouble with the government. You know, this is not my money I'm playing with. In the months, uh, Washington needed to know more where Jackie would go and at what expense. In the months that followed, Boucher did provide more detail. He would take Jackie first through the northern colonies, for one must not go abroad without knowing well one's own country. Then they would journey to England and from there explore continental Europe. Boucher thought the tour would take two years at an estimated cost of at least 1,000 pounds per year. While father and tutor considered Europe, however, Jackie himself was moving swiftly through his teen years, his interest expanding away from books toward dogs, horses, guns, clothing, carriages, and girls. These were things a youth of his background could be expected to have an interest in, but the air of disappointment uh, in the boy uh, could almost be tasted as you, as you read about Washington's concerns and eventually Boucher's concerns as well. By this point, Boucher had moved to pricey Annapolis, Maryland, and had taken Jackie within him, with him. Washington felt it was all the more urgent that Jackie make progress now that the expense of his education was increased. Washington was concerned that Jackie might stray from the path of virtue and innocence and requested that Boucher be very cautious in deciding to allow Jackie to sleep away from Boucher's residence. I mean, so you can see there's just this, this delegation of parental authority to, to the tutor at a, at a different location. Boucher's reply to Washington echoed Washington's concerns. Jackie faced two dangers, Boucher said his love of ease, and his love of pleasure. Boucher said he had never known a youth as lazy as Jackie. <laughs> he does not much like books, said his tutor. Even so, Boucher liked the boy and still hoped he would turn out, quote, if not a very clever, what is much better, a good man. For months, the tour was considered. Washington continued to be concerned about the expense, he had consulted the Custis family and found them also concerned. Initial expenses alone would consume half of Jackie's annual income from his estate. And now another consideration. What value was a tour when the foundation in reading with Jackie was so weak? By the end of 1771, Washington seemed to be increasingly frustrated with Jackie's lack of progress under Boucher's tutelage. A breaking point occurred around November of that year when Washington discussed Jackie's education with John Witherspoon, president of the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton University. Witherspoon criticized the lightness of Boucher's touch and noted that Boucher ought to have been teaching Jackie Greek. So you can imagine, I mean, Washington, he doesn't, he doesn't have a deep knowledge of you know, what a 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old boy should, be, should know by those, those respective ages. So he's, he's just sort of slowly trying to figure out from people and from Boucher, you know, what, what is best. And then he gets this, this take from Witherspoon that's very negative uh, about Boucher's training. So no, no Greek. Uh, Witherspoon's assessment appears to have been taken to heart by Washington, who reported to Boucher in a letter that unfortunately does not survive. Boucher smarted at the criticism and insisted that he was forming a literal, liberal gentleman rather than a punctilious pedant. You know, so Boucher kind of took the view that people like Witherspoon, they give the boys too rigorous a training and they become just school smart. I mean, today we probably call it, you know, there's a book smart kids, you know, they don't really understand the meaning or the value of what they're learning. There's memorizing stuff and they're able to answer questions. They might become good teachers to teach in that way later, but they're not really being formed as, as true gentlemen. Uh, so Boucher is still holding on to the idea that he's doing something better than what Witherspoon recommends. Um, Boucher did admit that he had been less than attentive to Jackie since their move to Annapolis more than a year ago, but he insisted that Washington had, quote, understood the matter worse than it really is. Even so, Boucher waived his fees for the entirety of Jackie's time in Annapolis and promised Washington he would do better henceforth. But the die was cast. 
Washington's eyes were opened. He now connected Jackie's slow academic progress to the shortcomings of the Reverend Boucher. The European tour was off. There was no sense in sending at great expense an inadequately educated boy to experience European culture. I'm sure you all would agree. <laughs> I'll ask you when I'm done whether you, you sent any of your children off to Europe. Um, Jackie continued under Boucher's care in 1772, but by the beginning of 73, Washington was out asking Boucher for college recommendations. So Washington, you know, he's tried the Tudor route. Now he's going to go the institutional route. Jackie had his own ideas. He soon announced his engagement to marry Eleanor Calvert, or Nellie Calvert, who was the sister of one of his fellow students in the Boucher School. George and Martha thought Jackie was too young and too immature, and they persuaded Nellie's parents to delay the wedding. Boucher knew the family, of course, and said that the, the young woman, quote, has merit enough to fix Jackie if any woman can. <laughs> So you get these comments, and I think this has shaped you know, historians' understanding of, of who Jackie Custis was. And I think we probably have leaned too much on these negative quips from his tutor, from Washington, uh, and so on, uh, as a boy who you know, so needs to be fixed by a sensible woman. Um, well, Jackie ended up heading off to King's College in New York, today's Columbia University, and Boucher and Washington closed accounts Boucher acknowledged, quote, that I did not do so much for him as I could and ought, but I really did more than I have, I really did more than I have feared you thought, or than many would, who appear more regular and attentive. Washington made no response to Butler's, uh, to Boucher's assessment. So off to King College, Jackie did not last long there. Initially, he reported that all was well, but he didn't attend to his studies, and after six months, he decided to quit. George was opposed. Martha was concessive. George ultimately conceded to Jackie's withdrawal from King's College, quote, contrary to my judgment and much against my wishes. What could he do? Jackie had his deceased father's large inheritance. He seemed set for life. George Washington had little financial leverage against Jackie, at a time when such leverage was, immensely, was an immensely important part of a father's toolkit in forming children of good character. By the time Washington accepted command of the Continental Army in 1775, Jackie had married Nellie, with whom he would eventually have four children. Washington, who would spend the next eight years of his life away from home, knew his 20-year-old stepson would have to carry a heavier load. Washington wanted Jackie to take care of his mother in Washington's absence. Jackie would also have to assume management of his own estate. Despite the unsatisfactory results of Jackie's education, Washington had some confidence that Jackie could manage the estate well. Quote, as you have never discovered a disposition to put it to a bad use. By the time the war was over, though, the value of the estate was much diminished under Jackie's control. Whether it was entirely Jackie's fault is not clear. This was a period of high inflation, and a good portion of the estate was in bonds of debt, which debtors now paid off in inflated currency. Jackie made some imprudent land deals as well. He sold lands for depreciated wartime money, a course Washington warned him against repeatedly. It has also been said that Jackie developed a gambling habit. All of these factors contributed, certainly, to Jackie being a poor businessman. Jackie did not join the Continental Army, but he does appear to have been reasonably active in the war effort. He served two years as a representative in the Virginia House of Delegates. Washington chided him for not attending the Assembly's session, but Jackie sent Washington news of Virginia politics that was as informative as any Washington was likely to receive from that quarter. Jackie also invested, along with Washington and several others, in an American privateering vessel 
that actually succeeded in capturing some British merchant ships on the Atlantic. Jackie spent much of the war at Mount Vernon as well as his own residence, and on some occasions accompanied his mother Martha on her many stays with George in camp. Martha spent literally half the war away from Mount Vernon with her husband. Jackie's efforts during the war were certainly not the stuff of military legend, but he does appear to have been something better than the rakish never-do-well that he has been sometimes depicted as by historians. Father and son appeared to relate to each other practically, cordially, throughout the war years. On some occasions, though, deeper sentiments surfaced. In June of 1776, Jackie sent Washington an effusive letter of gratitude, uh, which I would like to quote at, at some length. So this is Jackie in 1776 to George Washington. I am extremely desirous to return you thanks for your personal care, which on all occasions you have shown for me. It pleased the Almighty to deprive me at a very early period of life of my father, but I cannot sufficiently adore his goodness in sending me so good a guardian as you, sir. Few have experienced such care and attention from real parents as I have done. He best deserves the name of father who acts the part of one. I first was taught to call you by that name. My tenure years my tender years, unsusceptible of the loss I had sustained, knew not the contrary. Your goodness, if others had not told me, would always have prevented me from knowing I had lost a parent. I shall always look upon you in this light, and must entreat you to continue your wholesome advice and reprimands whenever you see occasion. You're free to quote this with uh, sons everywhere. <laughs> I entreat you to continue your wholesome advice and reprimands whenever you see occasion. It might be nice. I have two sons. It might be nice if they told me that. <laughs> Keep doing it, Dad. Keep criticizing me. Keep telling me what I'm doing wrong. I, I want it. I, I don't hear that very often. Um, I promise you they, your advice and reprimands, shall not be thrown away upon me but on the contrary, be thankfully received and strictly attended to. I often wished to thank you personally, but my resolution failed me. I thought I could more strongly express my gratitude in this manner, but my slender capacity cannot afford words expressive enough to convey the high idea I entertain of the many obligations I have received from you. This you may depend on. I shall with the greatest eagerness seize every opportunity of testifying that sincere regard and love I bear you. Washington responded in a letter that unfortunately also does not survive, but Custis's reply to that, letter, to that letter from Washington reads, I feel the sincerest pleasure that my professions of gratitude were received in the light I would wish them to be. I fervently wish to have an opportunity of fulfilling them by my actions. We feel we must regard Jackie's letter as sincere and representative of his sentiments toward Washington at what was, as it turns out, a crucial turning point in their relationship. Earlier in 1776, Washington had, direct, had directed the making of a major settlement of accounts with Jackie, as Jackie had just turned 21, the age of his majority. This was a crucial moment of financial parting of ways. Jackie would be acquiring full control of his estate, both its fixed assets of land and slaves and its liquid cash assets. He was coming into his inheritance, and George Washington was the man who was bringing it to him. Jackie rightfully saw this moment of transition as an opportunity to thank his stepfather for all had he, he had done since Jackie was four. This was owed Washington and would also smooth this critical transition point in their relationship. Even so, it is hard to avoid the impression of a certain distance between Washington and Jackie. And Washington's relationships with his aides in camp, among them John Lawrence, Alexander Hamilton, and the Marquis de Lafayette, 
look more intimate than his relationship with Jackie. Lafayette, for example, became almost a second son to Washington. He was all of 19 years old when he joined the American cause. Washington soon grew in esteem and affection for the young Frenchman. Those accustomed to viewing Washington as emotionally detached and who find that image confirmed in his relationship with his stepson Jackie will be jolted by the human warmth conveyed in Washington's letters to Lafayette, both during and after the war. Washington praised Lafayette's, quote, innate goodness and, quote, the excellence of your heart and admitted he had no words to express his affection, which were themselves words enough. The relationship stretched long after the war ended. Lafayette named his first son after George Washington. And George and Martha served as the child's godparents. The boy attended Harvard and lived with Washington during his presidency and later at Mount Vernon. Lafayette called Washington my adoptive father and my father, my best friend. You just don't, you just don't get that kind of affectionate exchange, at least in the letters that survive between Washington and Jackie. Well, in the fall of 1781, uh, as Patriot forces converged on Yorktown, Virginia for a decisive showdown with the British Army, Jackie Custis offered his services to Washington as a personal aid. But he was at Yorktown only a short time before he, contra he contracted some sort of disease, a camp fever, as it was called, perhaps typhoid or meningitis. When the British surrendered, Custis, now desperately ill, requested to be taken to a height from which he could view the surrender ceremony after which he was transported 30 miles to an uncle's estate. Washington himself did not follow until November 5th, more than two weeks after the British surrender. Jackie died that very day. He was 26 years old. Washington's reaction to Jackie's death has been reported in various ways, from Washington's being, quote, uncommonly affected to his having, quote, no personal grief. Washington comforted Martha, who had now lost the last of her four children. You know, she had had four by her previous husband. Two had died before she married Washington. And then Patsy had died in 1773. So at this point in 1781, Jackie was her last surviving child. Washington comforted her and spent a week with her uh, for the funeral and other arrangements before returning to camp. Whatever may have been Washington's emotional response to Jackie's death, he continued in stoic fashion to do what seemed reasonable. Jackie had left a widow and four children. George and Martha took in the two youngest children. The two eldest remained with their mother, who remarried two years later and went on to bear 16 more kids. <laughs> Yeah, the story of Nellie, I guess, is a separate story. Maybe for Mother's Day, I <laughs> come back and talk about Nellie and her, her, uh, her 20 children. Um, by all accounts, the Washington loved those two grandchildren well. Washington was, according to one of them, the most affectionate of fathers. Ultimately, George, though he had no biological children of his own, served as guardian, father figure, estate administrator, provider, to perhaps, perhaps a dozen children of the extended family. He and Martha, childless together, were busy parents for years to children begotten and born by others. And what of George and his only son, Jackie? It's not unreasonable to suppose that Jackie Custis, whatever personal flaws he may have had, really did appreciate George Washington as his stepfather, and that George did all he could to raise the four-year-old boy to manhood. Had Jackie Custis survived the war, he might have perfected his course in life and made his father proud. Then as now, it's great folly to suppose a father-son relationship has taken its final form in the son's young adult years. But the difficulties George and Jack encountered reveal strains of an 18th century kind. 
George was stepfather to another man's heir. The law said Jackie was a Custis, and the Custis family would have looked askance at any effort to make Jackie a Washington. Whatever paternal impulses Washington had toward Jackie were constantly being shaped, limited, and checked by culture and by law. Washington has the brilliantly singular designation of being father of his country. He was faithful guardian to Jackie, but his fatherhood found expression and bore fruit on a bigger stage. In the extended family, in the military workplace he created in camp, in the new young nation he governed as first president. Washington's particular circumstances helped chart his course. He was a man in his professional prime during the revolution, and his children, the two children uh, from Martha, were grown. This did not eliminate his parental obligations on the home front, but they did free him to devote himself more fully to the revolutionary cause. His parenting of Jackie, however difficult and unfruitful, was far from done when Jackie's death in 1781 cut the relationship short. Washington was the father of his country, but father of his family, too, as long as he and they lived. Happy Father's Day to you all. <laughs>